Hello, everybody. It's evening where I am. It's the middle of the day or the morning where you are. Um, I'm not able to 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 join this sit on a regular basis, and every time I come on to teach, it is so moving to see this committed group of more than 100 practitioners. I know that I so need uh, the grounding, uh, clarifying practice, like like what we're going to do together today um, in these hard times when the world is just so, uh, so, so topsy-turvy, so strained. So the intention and the inspiration that I wanna offer us for our sit today I I got clear about um, what I wanted to do um, with with us together today, before the um, the the most recent and acute tragedy in um, in Gaza of the killing of the seven aid workers who were really just just in Gaza just to simply feed hungry people, uh, and so that event it it really sharpens um, what I'd like us to do together today. Um, so I want to offer us today for the, the duration of our time together, I want you to hold in mind, um, I couldn't figure out how to get them in my frame, but imagine sitting here in front of me, I want you to hold in mind the image on one hand of a rich red kos kiddush, a kos shabracha, whenever we make kiddush, it is as a sign of the fact that we are blessed and that the moment is blessed and, um, at the Passover Seder, we have four such cups. And then side by side with that, Kos Miriam. I'm gonna share with you my own uh, tradition around Kos Miriam throughout the course of the teaching. But the entire time we're together, I want you to hold these two cups in mind because we're gonna be moving between the energies that they hold for us as uh, the work we're gonna do in our sit. So there's a very powerful um, advanced uh, uh, Buddhist meditation technique called Tonglin. And it is the practice that when I uh, exist open-hearted here in Israel, it's the practice that feels the most authentic to me. It's too much for us to do together today. It's really intense. So in Tonglin, we face the suffering in the world directly and fearlessly. And in our practice, on the inhale, we actually draw all that suffering in, keeping faith in our ability to metabolize all things. And then on the exhale, the intent is to send it back out as um, purified energy, loving energy, to, to, to be in the suffering, to take it in and to give it back to the system um, as something else. And when I hold um, the suffering in Gaza in mind, that for me is the most authentic practice. For us on the Jewish calendar, we have shades of this. When we think about um, the Passover Seder, so I know for me this year in the Passover Seder, I'm going to be holding uh, Vahisha Amda differently. And we got a taste of this in Purim. This, you know, you might you might know the joke that they say about all of our holidays that... um. They tried to kill us, but they did it. Let's eat, right? So, so in the Shamda, the difference, the taste we get of it at Purim, the way it's different in Pesach is that in Pesach we say, yes, in every generation we face threat, but then God is there to to save us, um, and so that's that feeling of 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 feeling saved and feeling grateful for feeling saved and pure celebration. And so I want to take us now, I'm going to take us into the sit, and we're going to go into the moment of the Passover Seder, of the reciting of the Ten Plagues, and I'm going to uh, tell you about my own family's tradition of Miriam's cup, and then we're going to get quiet and get practicing. So we use Miriam's cup. It's a cup that we fill with water, inspired by the story of Miriam's well. It's a story for another time. Um, that, the, uh, But it's a cup, and it's named for her, and it has water in it. And we at my Seder use it after we remove 10 drops of wine from our Kos Shel Bracha in honor of the suffering in the 10 plagues. And we pass around this Miriam's cup and we dip our finger in it to cleanse the, to cleanse the, all that, that, that pain away and rebalance. And so I'd like us to begin to move now into the sit. And whether you're inspired by that Tonglin practice or whether you wanna just keep in mind these two cups, 
I'd like us to work in the energy of these two cups for our sit. So I'm gonna talk us into a sit right now. You can begin to take a comfortable seated position. And what we're going to do, the sort of less intense mode I'm gonna to suggest to you is that on the inhale, you draw in the kos shel bracha, that, that, that sense of gratitude, the celebration in the wine. And on the exhale, you exhale out that sense of, of purification. Maybe it's the tears of honoring of suffering. And we're gonna work in that way in the cycle of the breath, inhaling joy and exhaling honoring of suffering. Now the Tonglin recipe is the reverse of that. If you wanna give it a try, you can, it's up to you. So let's now get still, get quiet. Join me now in taking a comfortable seated position. If you can, let your feet be flat on the floor unless you're sitting cross-legged. Gently close the eyes. If there's a back to your chair, you wanna let your shoulder blades rest into the back. On the next inhalation, feel the spine grow taller, feel the crown of the head stretch towards the ceiling. And on the next exhalation, feel yourself settle into your body into this here and now. Visualizing and feeling the energy of these two cups, a cup of joy and a cup of purification or tears. And acknowledging how very present both of these dynamics are in the world right now. How important it is for us to be able to inhale from that cup of joy, to gather in community at a Seder, to raise a cup for Kiddush, to feel that we are protected. And then on the exhale, how important it is to also make space for the great pain that is real now. Working in these dynamics. Inhaling that sense of joy. And exhaling. Offering our witnessing, maybe even our tears with the suffering. Let the breath be fluid and full. So give yourself permission to fill up with joy. And then on the exhale, give yourself permission to release in whatever way you need. Maybe it's a sigh, deep exhales.
Let the thoughts should wander, coming back. Each breath cycle, deepening into this balance of joy and sorrow. Now, because of the Passover Seder, there's an aspect of the 10 plagues that we actually do with our hands. If it's comfortable to you, you might try opening the palms. And actually imagine yourself holding in the right hand that red cup symbolizing joy. And then holding in the left that clear Miriam's cup. It embodies all of the healing that this world still needs, perhaps that we still need. And feeling the inhalation of joy coming through the right. And sending the exhalation of healing out the left. But these energies begin to loop and spiral around you. Begin to feel the wholeness in their relationship. A little bit like a yin yang or like a leviathan here. Inhaling the joy through the right. Counterbalancing. On the left.
Now we've been working in this way in acknowledgement of what's going on in the world around us and in Israel. So before we leave our practice, I'm going to broaden us a little bit to just do some taking stock. So feeling the celebratory energy on the right and the red cup and the healing and yearning for healing on the left in Miriam's cup. And just doing a temperature check for yourself. This awful war in Israel has been so polarizing, including in the Jewish community. So feeling this evenness in your practice, and making space to acknowledge, where have I been leaning myself? More on the right, with a sense of Jewish pride and power. More on the left with a sense of numbed by the need for healing. And feeling the balancing in this practice, allowing it to begin to balance your own reactions in that way evening it out just like we've been evening out this movement from joy to the honoring of suffering we inhale drawing in that sense of joy and i exhale honoring the suffering that is very real I feel the balance. I let my breath help me to cultivate that sense of balance. We'll close our practice today where we began. A reminder of that affirmation of faith. That though we face threat in every generation, we survive, we are saved. There is reason for gratitude. So you might for the last few breaths of our sit, without opening your eyes, just allowing the gaze to turn upward. Or it might feel more natural for you to just bow the head a little. And feeling that sense of being held and protected. that claim that the Haggadah makes, that we are held and protected. And as we close, let's each of us take one last deep breath in, drawing in joy. 
And at the top of the breath, I want to invite you to open your eyes and set the intention to send out that joy to someone else sitting today that you can see on your screen. And with that, we'll close our practice. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we will uh, have a chance to have a little conversation and questions um, in a moment uh, about the practice and hope you can stay around if you need to leave us. We wish you shalom, farewell and hope you'll come back tomorrow or uh, whenever you can join us at 1230 Eastern time. Um, and right now we have an opportunity for those who are saying Kaddish to do so. If you'd like to enter the name in the chat of Anyone you were holding in mind or heart today in memory uh, as we recite Kaddish, please feel welcome uh, to put their name in the chat. And we'll also, we have the text um, up on the screen, and I'll invite you, if you're reciting Kaddish, to um, join me. You can unmute, and we can say the Mourner's Kaddish together. Yitzkadal, Yitzkadash, Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Sarah, thank you so much uh, for leading us in that practice. Um, uh, you know, and, and this question of balance that's so important, I think it's, you know, it's so um I, I wrote in and we had a newsletter that went out last night with, you know, our pre-Pesach newsletter. And I wrote at the beginning, like, I feel like a lot of people, I think, are approaching the Theder this year with a bit of trepidation, you know, um, about how do we hold so much, really. Um, and I think it was really a, um, yeah, it was just such a lovely, lovely is the wrong word, <laughs> useful, um, helpful um, uh, practice that you offered. And I, I'm wondering for you, you know, as you're moving towards, you know, we're a few weeks out now from Pesach, um, just for you personally, if you want to reflect on how this practice is showing up for you or how it's useful um, in holding these and, and for, for everybody in the in the group, um, I imagine, you know, I, I, I'll i just, I'll say before we get to that question also, I just want to say, I think what's also so helpful, what I appreciate about it so much is somebody was saying to me yesterday, you know, sometimes I feel like our practice can be just this way of like soothing ourselves. It's sweet, you know, it, it can feel good. And we need sweetness a lot of times. There's a lot of bitterness, also a theme of the Seder. Um, but uh, but obviously we don't just do this to feel better, right? We do this to be able to show up and respond to the world and all of its brokenness um, uh, and not just avoid it, not just dodge it. And I think that was so helpful how you were doing that. So I, anyway, I just want to invite you to reflect on that and for, for everybody here, um, how that how that practice landed for you. And um, uh, if you can imagine making use of that in the weeks to come. Yeah, I always love hearing if you want to put in the chat how the practice led it for you. And also if you're um, how you're feeling approaching Seder, you know, as Josh is, as Josh is saying, even if we can't read them now, we'll all read them afterwards. Um, yes. Yeah, so I know for me that um, what's especially powerful and awe-inspiring and heartbreaking this year is just how um 
how to the point our Jewish holidays are. <laughs> so mm-hmm. this these themes that I brought to us in the practice today, I, they've been there all along. They just jump out so, so forcefully now. So for me, um, you know, I really... I really wrestled with this with Purim. Uh, Purim and Israel felt, you know, there was a, a a lot of talk of among people who who celebrated Purim kind of traditionally of like, God, it kind of feels like dance band of the Titanic kind of, you know, kind of kind of vibe. And I know for me, I really had half a mind to just ignore Purim completely. And I and I I'm a deep lover of the Megillah, you know. I you know, and yet um, I really might have. But in Hanaton, um, we had the privilege that those of us who like tend to read every year Migila and Hanaton, we all got on a bus. We filled a bus of 50 people. I, I live on a kibbutz in the north of Israel. And we went and we did the reading in Kikara Hatufim. And that made sense. That's the, just to translate that, that's in Tel Aviv, the square where the yeah, hostage, hostage families, have, the hostage families have been gathering. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden that made sense because the Megillah was just too, too to the point. It was too personal. It was too, you know, it, it was so on the nose that that's what makes it so uncomfortable. Um, and I think, I think for, for Seder too. Um, and then I think that there's this added layer, especially if you're um, in places in the world where anti-Semitism has spiked, where, where Seder is just, it's how we come together as as Jews, right? It is just such a Jewish thing that we we get together around a meal and we tell the story of our people through dialogue, through questioning, through symbols. And so I think showing up, holding that kind of Jewish calling card, it's it's really fraught this year. It's really fraught this year for folks, um, which is why we need practice. We need practice mm-hmm. to have the courage and the fortitude to show up open hearted in spite of how, how mm-hmm. tough it is. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a question here from Stacy that I think very on point um, to that, which is she said, I love that breathing in the pain, that I love that breathing in the pain and synthesizing it out as peaceful energy or maybe metabolizing, right? Um, and yeah, can you explain the process a bit more, um, which of course is drawn drawn on its own practice. So yeah, you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's so I'll put it in the chat. It's called Tonglen. Um uh so it, Tonglen practice is a is an advanced Buddhist meditation technique. So one has to in the traditional Buddhist context, one passes through several levels of initiation before they begin Tonglen practice. Um uh and and uh, you know. For, uh, I've I've long wanted to do a uh, a mindfulness retreat, sort of like right, you know right like on the Gaza border. This is before the war broke out, just when Gaza was just a a site of suffering that I as an Israeli was expected to basically ignore. Um, do doing this practice because at a at a certain point when we um, well let, let me say it differently. We can leave Gaza out of it. I made Aliyah from Los Angeles. Um, and one of the things that was so difficult for me um, about living in Los Angeles, we ha- there's a homelessness epidemic in Los Angeles. And generally speaking, California, it's, one doesn't die if they sleep outside. So lots of folks sleep outside. But growing up in, in, in L.A., there's there's a homeless person or homeless families on basically every freeway off ramp. And it was an unspoken contract in my family and my community that we didn't see, we just didn't see these people. These were people that I was meant to not see. And that not seeing, um, it, it just killed me. I just, I'm not, I'm not made for it. I don't know how to do it. And I don't know how to be spiritually alive and awake while maintaining that kind of blindness. So Tonglen practice takes that dynamic and it goes right into the heart of it. It says there is no turning aside you know, in, in a Buddhist context, we have we keep in mind that uh, you know there's a basic conviction in Buddhism that for as long as a single being is suffering, we are all suffering, and so we just hold suffering in a collective way, and then we we take charge of our own capability to metabolize everything, including suffering, and we just go directly into it, and with a great deal of fortitude and and practice and training, and this is not for a uh, for you know, not for the faint of heart, we we dive in and we say, mm-hmm. "I can do this." 
I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that comes to mind about metabolizing <laughs> and, um, and, 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 the fact that like Pesach is the one time of the year we're actually commanded to eat something. Mm -hmm. um, like you're supposed to eat. What is that about? You know, and, and re-eating lechem oni, eating the bread of affliction. Like, mm -hmm. okay, talk about metabolizing suffering, right? I mean, And it's hard to digest like, the matzah. Yeah. And it's very hard <laughs> and you need prunes and like other things, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. We won't get into the, 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 the dietary things too too much that's too painful um but <laughs> a question laura asked another question do you have any practical suggestions for how to access joy in order to breathe in joy in our practice in these increasingly painful days yeah hmm. I mean, going to the other end yeah 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 no i think you know if if you are a i i i think that i've had the privilege of holding this sit maybe three or four times since the war broke out and if you're paying attention like i, I can't get away from doing something that is acknowledging what's going on outside so it's something i'm working on uh too and having said that look this is this is always the very starting point of our practice even you know even when we're like in Hawaii for a month, you know, with all expense paid, right? The the fact of human existence is that always 100% of the time, there are things that are pleasant and things that are unpleasant. And the practice is about cultivating the attention and choosing to, you know, to amplify the good and to work with the painful. And so even now there's, you know, there is joy, there is joy. Mm -hmm. um, I do think this one piece, I think I have it a little bit easier than you, uh, meaning unless you're in Israel too. I think that this, if we're talking specifically about what the Jewish people is living through, there's an additional dimension for us here in Israel of a tremendous sense of peoplehood and also pride. You know, I spend every day, all day surrounded by heroes who are brave and selfless. And there's a real sense of, of um, there's all kinds of positive that goes alongside of the negative. Now I'll be honest, that is waning. And, you know, there's a really bad week here and, you know, things are, things are like, I really hope this war ends really soon, but, um, but, but there has been joy in Israel alongside the, the suffering but, and that's the thing. There's always joy alongside the suffering and there's always suffering alongside the joy, whether we like it or not, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, the, 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 thank you, Natasha, for the comment about matzo. <laughs> uh, very good. Yeah, I, I, I think, Sarah, that's, that's so helpful to hear. And just about, you know, I think I think to my opening comment about... Um, you know, it's it's not. We don't do this just to soothe ourselves and only to feel the good stuff, right? Um, and it's not even about retreating from um, the world. Like uh, I, I, Gil Fransdell is a, is a teacher that I um, listen to a lot. Um, I, I, I sit with sit with him in the mornings, um, many, many mornings, um, early when it's still dark in my kitchen. Um, he's in my ear. And uh, uh, he, ha he had a talk um, a few weeks ago where I remember he said something like, um, you know, the term retreat, he's like, I, w I wish we had a different term than retreat, right? Um, because it's not actually what it's supposed to be. You're not retreating from the world. It's actually about getting deeper into, right? And being able to be more present. Um, if anything, it's, you know, all the stuff that the noise that's in the re our regular lives is a distraction from the real things that are going on sometimes. And so um, I think in a certain sense, Pesach is the same thing as, as are all of our holidays are these chances to tune into this wavelength of reality that we often um, allow, allow ourselves not to see or hear, you know, um, and to be more, <laughs> more sensitive, <laughs> excuse me, more sensitive to it. Um, yes. so anyhow, that, yeah, just, just a plus one uh, everything that you're saying. Um, there's a comment from Nancy here. It says the Hebrews were enslaved for centuries before liberation. Many lived and died without knowing that freedom was coming for the people, though not for them personally. The larger perspective of the collective can help me tolerate the pain and connect with hope. 
Yeah, thinking thinking in larger larger time expanses, line time horizons, possibly. Um, yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful comment, Nancy. You know, and Nancy, your comment reminds me of the very opening of the Exodus story. The Exodus story, the entire saga begins with um, with a groan offered, uttered by this by by the Jewish people as slaves. Um, but it takes them 200 years to groan in that way. So, you know, the rabbis ask what, you know, what, what changes and perhaps it's the birth of, of Moses that it gives them the ability to begin to ask to be saved. But I think that the, I think that that's, there's a potential in this moment for that, you know, can we find through, through this very difficult time for the Jewish people, wherever we are in the world, can we somehow allow it to, to have something shift so that we can find that deep call for, for liberation, for whatever, for the next, the, the next mm -hmm. thing that, that I pray reconstitutes from this, this time of great, you know, brokenness and pain. Yeah. And not only from the things that are plaguing us from the outside, but the things that are, you know, from the inside. Right. Um, that it's it, it's not only to I, 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 I worry a little bit about the Hisha Amda, right, um, this year, uh, that it allows us to externalize a little bit. Right. Um, the Hisha Amda, La Botheina Vamanu, in every generation, you know, the whole of they all they're always coming, you know, coming for us. Right. Um, uh, but I, I wonder about. Um, uh, um, you know, whether that's also an invitation to inner work, if there's a way, you know, in a Hasidic sort of move to to see that as not only like an externalized threat, which obviously there are real external threats, yeah. but also the inner work, right, of, of what does that mean um, internally for us? Um, uh, what, what's the work that we can be doing this, you know, this year? And what's the opportunity, even in these very, you know, profoundly difficult moments? Um, yeah, thank you for calling us into all of that. Um, such a really wonderful and rich practice and so great to have you here, Sarah. Um, it's an honor to be with you all. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, and, and Cheryl, we're making some word wordplay on retreat and treat and treatment. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, all right, well, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, same time and channel. Mark will be back tomorrow at his regular time. Um, we did a little switcheroo. Usually I'm on Tuesdays. We had to switch up this week, so I'm happy to be here. Wednesday feels totally different. Such a different experience on Wednesday. Um, anyhow, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, we'll see you again soon.